I think that's about it. So without any further ado, we uh, had a great talk from Jeff Veen uh, this morning about equanimity. And now uh, John Ospla is going to talk to us about uh, exercising our anticipation muscles. So please help me welcome John Ospla, Velocity Co-Chair. Thanks. Is the microphone working? It is. Okay. So uh, there's a lot I want to get through because I'm super excited about this topic. Um, today I'm going to talk about anticipation. Um, a lot of what we talk about here at Velocity is about building resiliency and building resilient systems. Jeff gave a talk about this morning. I'm having, a, what's it like to have a resilient response? What's it like to have a resilient team? Um, part of building and maintaining resilience is developing your anticipation skills and flexing these muscles and getting them, giving them a workout. Um, one quick, quick note, and the word that, that's come up in a couple of sessions uh, so far is this word complex. And it's true, we work in complex systems. Now, just to be technical about it, a small amount of semantics is that complex, a complex system is different than a complicated system. Sometimes these things are, are, are used interchangeably. Um, uh, quick uh, quick uh, four sentence uh, or so uh, in systems theory. My car key is simple. My car is complicated. Traffic is complex. The difference is that the, uh, the car has possibly some uh, fundamentally surprising things or surprising things that can happen to it, but is the result of the components all interacting together. Complex systems have emergent behaviors. They are not just the result of all of their components. So, um, so that's what I mean by that. Anticipation is important. Um, when talking about complex systems, because that is how we can help, uh, that's how we can help ourselves in the future. So um, I realize a lot of people uh, flew here, uh, so they might not have, you know, sharp objects in their bags, but how many people here normally carry one of these in their bag? Or at home, at very least, right? Um, is there anybody here who has one of these in their bag right now? All right. Presumably, well, you thought maybe you needed to fix something while I was talking. Um, we unconscious, this is okay, this is expected, we are engineers. It is, it is in our nature, it is an unspoken skill of anticipating worst case scenarios. That's what we're talking about when we talk about anticipation. So, uh, the broader scheme of anticipation, um, and something that we should just recognize, it is that it is amongst a spectrum of approaches um, on building resilient systems. And I'm going to work backwards. These are Eric Hallnagel's uh, famous uh, super smart guy um, who studies cognitive engineering, system safety, human factors. Um, there is learning, right? This is uh, last year I spoke about postmortems. Um, this is learning what has happened, understanding how something broke, uh, what did you do to fix it, and all of that sort of thing working backward, then there's the response. You have some response to, you go, you're going to fix something. Something's busted, something has an unexpected um, uh, a, a result, you're going to go work on it. There is knowing what to look for, which should be uh, apparent to everybody, which is monitoring. And there is anticipation, which comes above uh, and in front of most of these things. Um, this is what we're going to talk about. We approach anticipation, why don't you just say, well, I could just stand here and say, well, um, yeah, we anticipate, we've got worst case scenario mindsets. What else is there to talk about? It's a little bit more complex than that, or complicated. Um, uh, when we approach designing systems, when we approach the day-to-day -day work that we do, when we approach the, how we respond to issues, and learning. We all, we have anticipation approaches to each one of those, and that's what we're going to talk about. It's about having the answer to this question. What could possibly go wrong? If we get into the habit of asking this, when we design things and we respond to things and we learn about things, um, then we will flex these muscles. This is what we ask every Etsy engineer to do, for example, um, and we ask this question all the time. Human factors and cognitive engineering folks call this requisite imagination. This is a thing. 
is the ability to foresee potential pitfalls in the future. Um, uh, some companies do uh, have a couple of what you might call best practices on how to exercise this muscle. There are architecture reviews, which is we've got this new application, we've got this new infrastructure. Um, now I'm going to put it on a whiteboard and poke some holes in it. You know, let's see, see wh where, where it could break down, that sort of thing. There are go or no go or operability reviews, sometimes we call it Etsy. And that is, that is before we launch something publicly, we ask the question, what keeps you up at night? about this thing that we're about to launch tomorrow? What's the, what's the thing that, make, that worries you the most? And we ask all the people involved with the project. And then there are game day exercises, um, of which Jesse Robbins has done a decent amount of talking on, which are relatively contrived, but true and real uh, scenarios where we actually shut things off and we make failures happen in the live world, knowing that we want to measure how our response. So, design. We need to ask the question, do we make effort in our design process to anticipate failures? Of all of the things that could go wrong, experience is a huge part of this, right? The things um, considered by somebody who's never designed something before are different than the things of the, the considerations made by a mid-level or a journeyman engineer are different from the expert, the guy who has been, who's seen it all. They all have valid uh, viewpoints, and they should all be taken into consideration. It's not just not the expert. Um, uh, uh, Buddhism and, and, and meditation uh, students call this beginner's mind. You do have fresh eyes. Um, sometimes they're misguided. Sometimes they are not. You may say to yourself, but John, I don't need anticipation. I build adaptive systems. I've got automation. I've got fault tolerance. I've got self-healing, all of that stuff. Um, as it turns out, these guys build adaptive systems. <laughs> these guys build adaptive systems. These guys build adaptive systems. These folks too. This guy had adaptive systems. These guys had adaptive systems. Adaptive systems don't save you. They don't prevent you from having to exercise anticipation and, and, and have this requisite imagination. Mike Christians, who is uh, a uh, super smart engineer, he heads up the business continuity planning at, at Yahoo, tells this great story of, um, he was actually at a conference. He gets this phone call. One of the multitudes of data centers that Yahoo has went completely dark. Everything's okay. They shifted traffic to other data centers, whatever. But a squirrel had gotten into the main electrical feed for the data center and he had chewed through the cable. Um, it was an okay day for Mike Christians because Yahoo didn't suffer all that much. The squirrel, not so much. Um, but I can't, I can't imagine, you know, if, if during the design of that data center, you know, you got all of the architects and the engineers and the power guys and the HVAC guys that are on this conference table looking at blueprints, blueprints and before they like say, all right, well, it's good, let's, you know, dig into the ground. Or like, imagine if somebody said like, wait, wait, uh, what are we gonna do about the squirrels? Um, and you know, imagine, you know, bags of acorns and, you know, around the building and dummy, you know, electrical so that the, you know, squirrels can attack the different ones. Adaptive systems are, n are, are adjustable. They are adaptive. They are not magic. They have a target. They have expected variation. I'm going to give the, uh, a really super simple example, the shock absorber on your car, all right? Uh, it, is, it, is, it is there to maintain a particular level of service, a particular expectation uh, amidst variation. Um, you, have, you expect your car to be flat as you go over potholes and various disturbances in the road. It looks like this. A disturbance comes in, the pothole, and your shock absorber is there. Everything's fine. I'm on a flat road, and then I see some ter I see some potholes or some things from roadkill or something is in the road, and and it's going to make me a bump. This is okay because we've designed for this type of scenario. We're still within the envelope until, and this is called compensation, by the way, um, until compensation is exhausted. All adaptive systems have this. Um, uh, all of them. You, you will not be able to plan for all of them because, like I said, complex systems are, have emergent phenomena. So, this is the money shot. 
this is what you're this is what you're looking for we have this in systems we will breach this barrier um, this is uh, compute and data store there are uh, uh, routers and switches and, and 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 CDNs you have this issue with staff you have the you have people who go out on sick leave. You have family emergencies. You have vacations. You have the Velocity Conference. Um, uh, we have this situation with the tools that we build. Are they on hand? Do we have to improvise some? This happens with funding. This happens with anything. So what does that bring us to? Done with design, we are now at work. This is the th stuff that we do every day. There's human discretion. I don't care how much automation you have, that chef recipe is not going to write itself. So there's human discretion in everything that we do. Um, do. The question we need to ask here is, do we approach our day to day? We do, but do we approach it explicitly with anticipation? So st stick with me for the next two or three slides. The predictability of a given situation and a given individual. You wake up in the morning, you've got a couple of tasks. Some of the tasks are routine. Some of the tasks you've never done before, you're pretty sure you need to, that you know how it's going to go. Um, and then there are things that you have to do or things that will happen during the course of what you need to do that are completely unthought of. Right? So if you see this on a graph, this is not my graph, by the way, um, uh, of the uncertainty events, there are frequent and well-described things. These are the known uncertainty. Uh, there's the unknown, which are rare and complicated, um, not really well described, and then there's the unknowable. These are the ones that you read in the papers. These are the ones, thank God, the web doesn't kill people when it goes down thus far, but, uh, but in, other, in, uh, in other fields of engineering, this does happen. So if you split this up into unthought of situations, meaning I woke up that morning, I'm sure that Jeff had no idea when he woke up that morning it was probably, if somebody said in a time machine, Jeff, this is what's going to happen, he would be like, you're high. <laughs> that is implausible. It's unlikely that this is going to be the scenario. It's an unthought of situation. What we want to do is uh, we want to make the number of potential situations um, not just think that they could possibly happen, but know what we'll do when that happens. We want to broaden this. We want to get rid of the unthought of situations. We want to increase our knowledge of the risk of the things that we do, and we want to develop our ability to project ourselves into the future. When this happens, what's gonna, what are you going to do, right? Well, I know that the, I don't know where the fire extinguishers are in this room. Oh, there's one, right? I know what I'm going to do. There's going to be a fire. There's a fire extinguisher over there. This is the th type of education that we have, whether we know it or not. My argument is that we need to make it explicit. When we respond to things, can we anticipate problems with our troubleshooting? This is different. We almost always think of design. Sometimes we think of work. But developing our ability to respond, applying this creative requisite imagination, this community is not known for being creative. But we are on a daily basis. Do we have the right tools lying around when something goes wrong? Can we reach for them really quick? Um, uh, can we have the raw materials to fashion tools? Do I have an ability to, um, uh, to, to compile this new tool that I just Googled about because something's going on and I'm told that this new tool will help? Um, let me give you a good example. It's a dramatic example. Uh, just an excellent example. Sometimes well-known and anticipated things happen. Now. Uh, does anybody not know who what this picture is depicting? Okay. All right. So uh, sometime two years ago, um, Captain uh, Chesley Sullenberger takes off from JFK Airport in New York. Uh, an entire flock of Canadian geese fill his engines and bring uh, power to a, a standstill on his plane. Ninety seconds later, his plane is landed safely with all the passengers on the Hudson River alongside Manhattan. So, as it turns out, the first plane ever to be hit by a bird was, in 1905, Orville Wright. So what that means, arguably the inventor of the modern airplane, what that means is as long as airplanes have existed, birds have been hitting them. Okay? Um, it, bird strikes on airplanes is the most researched. So this isn't like 
unthought of. Um, this is something that is well understood. It is actually frequent. But Sullenberger needed to apply anticipation on what he was going to do once the event happened. He had all of the tools. He had the communication. He had the people. He had the calmness. He, one might say that he had the equanimity about him to land on the Hudson. This, was, this all happened within the span of 60 seconds. At Etsy, which is so different than flying a plane, um, uh, we had an outage. It was a very, it was a pretty long outage, um, and it was a huge bummer for us. And th what you see here is the, the status blog that we gave um, during, during the outage. Now, we have, like I said, a, a lot of fault tolerance. We build, um, uh, with uh, anticipation in mind, we build these, these systems. This was a network failure. There was a sort of core switching um, issue that went, went on. How the issue happened isn't what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is is the response. Um, like I said, we've anticipated a lot of different failure scenarios, but I can tell you this. I don't think that we anticipated that the two guys who were, who were uh, uh, qualified to work on it were going to be separated by distance. One guy in the data center and one guy in the office, and we did not anticipate that all of the communication was going to have to happen over phone because the network was down, which means reading commands and output to each other over the, over the phone from screen to screen. This takes a long time and it's a huge bummer if you've ever done it, especially if you're used to uh, hevel, heavy IRC usage and troubleshooting scenarios. Um, we also didn't, uh, didn't um, expect or anticipate there was going to be a, just a little bit of a dearth of people available to help communicate what was going on. I actually had just gotten on a plane and was about to lose uh, internet for like six hours. And, you know, uh, well, good luck, guys. Um, we also didn't humorously uh, anticipate that the second that the site went down, our CEO was about to take the stage to talk to other people about how awesome Etsy engineering was. Um, <laughs> which brings us to learning. Can we foresee our ability to learn from, from failure Decomposing. Who here has post-mortem meetings after outages? Okay, there's one, there's way, there's not enough hands going up. This is something you absolutely should do. Otherwise, you are, you, if you get hit by the same failure again, you deserve it. So, um, uh, for those people who do have post-mortem meetings, how many of you come up with, during the post-mortem meeting, come up with remediation items to prevent this sort of thing from happening in the, in, in the future? All right, this is all right, this is good. The question that I have to you, and I'm also projecting a little bit, is for those people who do have remediation items, do we know which remediation items that we came up with have saved us from future failures? And how often? So if we don't know this, if we don't reflect on this, then we can anticipate whether our, our uh, remediation, making remediation items is a form of anticipation. We want to do these things to prevent this type of failure in the future. If we have no idea if those are effective, we could be wasting a huge amount of time if we're not paying attention. Uh, another point is to succeed maturely. Um, for those of us lucky enough to not have failures very often, there's this paradox. Uh, Cosmo mentioned it yesterday during his talk. Um, success can breed overconfidence. We can't take past successes as a guarantee for future safety. Um, it means that we will likely ignore weak signals that are saying, you're going to drift, you're drifting into failure, something harsh is going to happen. Time and time again, um, non-web, real-world, catastrophic power plants, uh, space shuttles, uh, those types of failures bring this up over and over and over again. Um, and I can imagine our world of reasoning like, oh, what are these errors over here? I don't know. Uh, it's, you know, the site's fine, right? The site's fine. I don't really need to look at the, They've never been an issue in the past, so why would I look at them? So, there's a caveat, a big asterisk on all of this. 
and there is a danger in solely relying on uh, on anticipation. I, 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 I talked about this as, as, as being just one part of it, but I think that there is a danger in, in relying too much. And I'm going to read from this slide. Um, what immense and massive evil must result from allowing men to assume the right of anticipating what may happen. So now this is Tolstoy. This is an, a, kind of an extreme quote from a reasonably dramatic dude. Um, but the point is made that moderation is needed with anticipation. And I think that sometimes we forget this. Um, in our sort of macho, I'm an ops guy, I can think of all these crazy things going on. So on the one hand, of, on the one hand side of the spectrum, we have the zero ability to anticipate. Either we don't care or we're not trying hard enough at all. I don't know, it's probably fine, you know. I'm, I mean, what could go wrong? i just going to light up a cigarette while I fill up my car with gas. Whatever. Um, and on the other hand, there is the paranoid paralysis, the guy that says, everything could go wrong. What am I going to do? Whatever it is, don't touch it. Okay? This breeds the operation stereotypical manager that says no all the time. And you don't want to be that guy either. Because you're unable to make progress, and you're unable to learn, and you're unable to, 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 uh, to actually bring reality to your anticipation skills. So, where are you? This is a question you need to ask about your organization. Something else that happens quite often is you may associate failure, associate or, um, or, or, or overdevelop this anticipation muscle based on uh, experience with a particular technology. You work on a site, it runs in PHP and MySQL, the site goes down all the time, you leave that job, you want to go to the somewhere else, you say, whatever you do, don't use PHP and MySQL, which is ridiculous. The tools that we use and the software we use should inform our, 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 our future. It should inform our anticipation, but that shouldn't be the only thing. The scar tissue, what I like to say at Etsy is that the scar tissue of yesterday informs the architectures of tomorrow. And if you bring that, uh, if you bring that pendulum too far in the other direction, you're doing a disservice to your organization. You're doing a disservice to your ability to, to mitigate failure in the, in, in the future because you are narrowing your options. On the other side of this is mature requisite imagination where you use science, not irrationality, to inform your design choices. So, once again, anticipation is part of this entire thing. Tissue-based anticipation by itself is, uh, is, is terrible. Uh, I read this awesome quote the other day in that fear, I think I agree with it, fear is the anticipation of future failure. But confidence is the anticipation of future success. And this is what we're looking for. We're not looking for fear uh, because anything could go wrong, right? Your router could go down because the network cable is bad or there was a bad configuration, right? You know what's also possible? It's also possible that a herd of elephants will come into the data center and poop on your router. <laughs> this is not an impossible, there's not zero prob pr possibility of that happening. It could happen. But again, you have, an, uh, you have a spectrum. Requisite imagination is something that you need to build into your culture. You need to explicitly make, you need to uh, encourage having a conversation between all of the engineers not just one guy who's, some, who's like the smartest dude in the room, not just some guy who's the expert, definitely not some guy who just, you know, who wrote a book on the topic. You need to have everybody who's involved with building and responding and learning having this conversation. You need to have a, a constant sense of unease that's balanced with rationality. And again, I'm going to put this up one more time. This is what we're looking for. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with some homework. For the next uncommon and risky and, or deemed risky uh, thing that you do in your organization, whether it's you're going to flip data centers, you're going to make a, a, a major change to new infrastructure, you're going to migrate from one data store to another, something that's deemed risky, I want you to write down what you think, what you expect will happen. Not just failures, but what you expect to happen. And then I want you to write down what are the possible failure scenarios that could happen. 
get a pencil and a paper. That way it's very explicit. Don't use that uh, computer thing. Um, write down what you do expect to happen and what might fail during this scenario. As much detail as you can. First, have everybody on the team do this and don't let them share. D have them do it all by themselves. And then, in front of a whiteboard, all together, do the exact same exercise. Now, are there differences? Are there differences in expectations? Are there differences in the failure scenarios that people have, have imagined and have, and have and put their creative part of their brain on? And is there a difference between what is said in, by individuals and said from a group? If you get basically the same list from the group and individuals, you're probably uh, in good shape. If, you, if every individual comes up with everything that you came up with as a group, it's likely that you're not thinking hard enough. You didn't spend enough time on the exercise. This is the type of thing that just like getting on the treadmill or swimming some laps in the pool, builds your anticipation muscles and you have to keep at it. Confidence is what we're looking for, not fear. So that's the end of my talk. <laughs>